Hi folks, I'm Mitchell, if we haven't met, and we're reading Luke 12, 22, or on page 43 in our Essential Jesus books. We're going to start at the last paragraph on page 43. Then he said to the disciples, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat, nor about your body, what you will wear. For your life is more than food, and your body is more than clothing. Think of the crows, and how they do not sow or harvest, nor do they have a storehouse or a barn, and yet God provides for them. How much more valuable are you than the birds? And which of you, by your anxiety, can add a single moment to your lifespan? If you cannot achieve such a small thing, why are you anxious about the rest? Think about how the lilies grow. They do not work or make clothes, but I tell you, not even King Solomon in all his glory was dressed like one of these. Now, if this is the way God clothes the grass in the field, which grows today and is thrown into the incinerator tomorrow, how much more will he clothe you, people of little faith? And do not strive after what you will eat and drink or be worried. For these are the things all the nations of the world strive after, and your Father knows that you will need them. Instead, strive for his kingdom, and these other things will be given to you as well. Do not fear, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the poor. Make for yourselves money bags that will not wear out, a never-ending treasure in heaven, where no thief comes close and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, that's where your heart will also be, will be also. Be dressed ready for action and have your lamps lit. Be like people who are expecting their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks on the door, they open it immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds alert when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself ready to work, have them recline at the table and wait on them. Blessed are those servants. If he comes at midnight, or four in the morning and finds them alert. Now understand this. If the householder had known what time the thief would come, he would not have let him break into the house. You also be ready, because at the time you would not imagine the Son of Man would come. Peter said, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? The Lord replied, Who then is the faithful and prudent? manager whom the master will appoint over his staff to give them a food allowance at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing this task when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will appoint that one over all his possessions. But if that servant says in his heart, my master is delayed in coming, and so begins to beat the other servants and maids, and not eat and drink, sorry, enter, eat and drink and get drunk, then the servant's master will arrive on a day he does not expect, at an hour he does not know. The master will cut him in pieces and allocate him in a place with the unfaithful. That servant whom his master's wishes does not prepare for or perform his wishes will receive a great beating, but the one who does not know his wishes and yet does what is worthy of punishment will receive a light beating. From everyone who has been given much, much will be expected. And from one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be asked. I have come to cast fire upon the earth, and how I wish it were burning already. I have a baptism to experience, and how distressed I am until it is achieved. Do you suppose that I have come to establish peace in the world? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five people in one home will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided, father against son, and son against father, mother against daughter, and daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a rainstorm is coming, and so it does. And when a south wind blows, you say, a heat wave will come, and so it does. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of the earth and sky, but why don't you know how to interpret the current time? Why also do you not judge for yourselves what is right? So as you are going with your opponent to the ruler, make an effort to settle things with him, so that he will not drag you off to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the guard, and the guard throw you into prison. I say to you, you will certainly not get out from there until you have been repaid the very last coin. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks very much for uh, reading for us, uh, Mitchell. Uh, my name is Peter Rohr, if we haven't met, and uh, it's uh, great that we can meet together and uh, open up God's Word and look at the passage that we've just looked at. But why don't we pray and ask for God's help as we do so. Uh, our Father, we thank you uh, for the privilege and joy it is to meet together as Christian brothers and sisters around your Word. And we pray that as we uh, look at this passage tonight, you would speak to us, you, the living God, would address us by your Spirit. Uh, we pray that you would uh, give us understanding and that you would strengthen our faith in your Son, our Lord Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, as uh, Jocelyn mentioned, uh, we're thinking a little bit about identity uh, tonight. And how we think about ourselves affects how we live. Now, this is not going to be a, a psychology lecture, but it's true, for example, that if you want to read more, one of the ways to do that is to think of yourself as a reader. If you want to be uh, more kind in your relationships, to think of yourself as a kind person. It's also true negatively. Uh, it's all too easy to listen to what others say to us and let that cast a shadow over our lives. You're a useless person. You're lazy, whatever. But wonderfully, as Christians, uh, we have had the God of the universe affirm truths about us. Yes, we are sinful, we are, we are sinners, rebels against God, but because of Jesus, we are forgiven. We are dearly loved children of God. We are holy, we are righteous, we are blameless in His sight. Uh, it's sad that uh, many Christians give more weight to what other people say about them or what even uh, they themselves think about themselves than what God has said about us in His Word. Well, tonight uh, in our sermon series, we're in this central section of Luke's Gospel that goes from Luke chapter 9 to Luke chapter 19, and it traces the journey that Jesus takes uh, to Jerusalem. And it's a very windy journey as uh, Jesus moves from place to place and teaches about a range of topics uh, about what it means to follow Him. But we're going to zero in on one aspect that Jesus returns to a number of times, and that's our identity as Christians, a specific aspect of that identity, and that is of servant. As Christians, if you're a Christian here tonight, you are a servant of Christ. In fact, uh, the whole Bible ties our fundamental identity not to our family, our ethnicity, our gender, our, our sexual desires, but it ties our identity to who we worship, who we serve. That's what defines us fundamentally. Do we serve sin? Do we serve ourselves? Or do we serve, do we worship God and Christ? If you're a Christian, is that how you think of yourself? As a servant of Christ? Maybe that can seem a little bit demeaning. You know, we're, we're happy with the idea of being a son or a daughter of God, an heir with Jesus of the kingdom, but a servant? In fact, my guess is that for many of us, the idea of being a servant of Jesus doesn't enter our thinking all that much. Maybe our Christianity consists more in the idea of us getting along with our lives, doing our thing, achieving our goals, with God's help and with eternal life at the end. But that's not the picture of the Christian life that Jesus gives us. He reminds us that we are servants. We are slaves even of God and of Jesus. We belong to another. Our lives are controlled by another. And we need to think about that. And we need to let that truth about who we are shape how we live. Now, this little mini-series we're doing in, in Luke uh, is to understand uh, his presentation of Jesus so that we can share it with others. And it's important that we're clear, and we'll see it in this passage, that we don't obtain eternal life by serving God. Now, that's a distortion of the Christian message. We, we become Christians, we, we receive eternal life by trusting in God's gift to us in Jesus. But what this passage helps us to do is to think about what's next. 
What does the Christian life look like? And we'll see it is a life of service. But we'll also see that serving Jesus, <clears throat> excuse me, serving Jesus is unlike serving any other master. Well, we're going to uh, concentrate on uh, part of chapter 12 that Mitchell uh, read for us. It's there on page uh, 44, and we're, we're going to see three aspects of what it means to be a servant of Jesus. Firstly, it means to be ready for Jesus' return, to be ready for Jesus' return. Near the top of page uh, 44, I think the third paragraph down, uh, be dressed, ready for action, and have your lamps lit be, pe be like people who are expecting their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks on the door, they open it immediately. Or a few lines down, you also must be ready because at a time you would not imagine the Son of Man will come. Being a servant means being ready for Jesus to return because he will come back at a time we might not imagine uh, Jesus gives us two illustrations of what it, like, what it means uh, to be ready. Uh, they're quite different illustrations. Uh, one is of a wedding and one is of a, a burglary. Uh, first of all, the, the wedding uh, and uh, the, the thing that Jesus uh, focuses in on is the fact that weddings uh, at, at that time, different to, to weddings today, they, they could go for days. They could go for days. Uh, recently, in fact, there was a, a wedding in India where the son of India's richest man, uh, who is worth, I looked up, $172 billion, his son uh, was married, and the wedding took four days, including three days of reception. And there were 1,200 guests, including Mark Zuckerberg, John Cena, Hillary, and Bill Clinton. Uh, there were dozens of uh, chefs, who prepared uh, 2,000 dishes. I know that uh, some of us here are, are getting married in a few months' time. There's some ideas that you might have, uh, including a 10-page um, a manual of uh, the dress code for each stage of the wedding. Uh, now, the wedding that Jesus speaks of here uh, was not as lavish, but it, it was as long. And so, if you're a servant waiting for your master to come back from the wedding, you needed to be ready because your servant could come at any time. As you guarded your master's house, uh, you know that your master could return uh, at any time, even early in the morning. That's what Jesus says. Be dressed, ready for action, have your lamps lit. Be like people who are expecting their master to return from a wedding banquet so that when he comes and knocks on the door, they open it immediately. The, the picture is of the servants being so uh, uh, ready to anticipate their, their master's arrival that even before he knocks, they are ready to open the door and uh, let him in. It's a picture of expectation and eager readiness. And that is the picture of what Jesus wants us to be, uh, ready for Jesus to return. Now, we're going to think in a, in a few moments, what does that actually look like for us uh, as Christians? Uh, but Jesus doesn't just give us an illustration. He gives us a wonderful motivation for why we should live like this. He doesn't just tell us uh, what to do, but why we should do it. As he continues, blessed are those servants whom the master finds alert when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will dress himself ready to work, have them recline at the table, and wait on them. Blessed are those servants if he comes at midnight or four in the morning and finds them alert. Now, here is how being a servant of Jesus is so different. Here is the reward for the faithful servant. The, the master will turn the tables, so to speak, and serve the servants. This is the upside-down world of the Christian gospel. This is how being a servant of Jesus is so different to being a servant of anyone else. Uh, this didn't happen in the ancient world. It doesn't happen in, in our uh, world today. I don't imagine that, you know, big, lavish celebrity weddings, the host will kind of uh, come home from that and start serving his servants. It just doesn't happen, but it happens with Jesus. And we get a wonderful illustration of it in uh, John's Gospel. Uh, when Jesus is preparing for his death, what does he do? He washes his disciples' feet. Again, utterly unheard of in the ancient world. 
Uh, in, in fact, there's no account in any ancient text that we have of a master washing his disciples or his servants' feet. But Jesus does it. The promise is that if we're ready for Jesus when he returns, he will welcome, honor, and serve us. That's the upside-down world of being a servant of Jesus. And behind uh, this uh, image is the, the wonderful picture that we get in the Old Testament in Isaiah 25 of the banquet at the end of time. And it's a banquet that God prepares for those who are uh, believers in him. Isaiah says, on that mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. It's not that we prepare a feast for God. No, he prepares a feast for us. And uh, the image is, is striking, a rich food, aged wine, the best of meats, the finest of wines. That's the, the promise that God gives us. It's the, it's the promise of the, the reward after a lifetime of expectant service. It, it's extravagant. It seems over the top. But it's the encouragement that Jesus gives us to keep serving him faithfully. Blessed are those servants if he comes at midnight or four in the morning and finds them alone. But Jesus also uses a negative image, the positive image, the wedding, the negative image of someone who is not ready, and a person who's not ready for the thief to break into their house. Uh, now, understand this, if the householder had known at what time the thief would come, he would not have let him uh, break into his house. I had a friend at university uh, who was uh, studying uh, in his uh, bedroom on the top floor of his share house, and uh, there was a knock at the door. And uh, he went and he opened the door and uh, there was a policeman standing there. And the policeman had come to tell him that he had been burgled. Uh, he'd just been studying so hard or maybe he had some uh, music on so loud or knowing this guy there might have been another factor that might have prevented him from hearing what was going on downstairs. Uh, a, a burglar had broken in uh, while he was upstairs and robbed him without him knowing. If my friend had known uh, that when the thief was coming, he would have been ready and he would not have uh, let his house be broken into. The point that Jesus is making is that we can't know, we won't know, when Jesus will come back. And so verse 40, you also must be ready because at a time you would not imagine the Son of Man will come. And so you must always be ready. Uh, we live in, in Newtown, uh, which uh, thankfully doesn't seem to be as bad as it used to be, uh, but I have a routine every night, and um, I can see my family rolling their eyes already. I, I hide my laptop, not because I think my laptop is my most precious possession in, in the world, I just know it would be a real hassle if I lost my laptop. So every night I hide it, I'm not going to tell you where, um, I hide my laptop uh, so that if we get broken into, you know, look, they can take everything else. They can take, you know, everyone else's uh, possessions. But they're not, gonna, they're not getting my laptop. And, um, yeah, e every night I, I hide it. Um, and, you know, it's my, my little, you might say my little obsessive, I might say my little sensible way of always being ready, uh, always assuming that a thief might break in that night. And that is the stance that we're to take towards Jesus, always to assume that today is the day that he might come back. And so there's almost a, just an automatic way of living the Christian life. You just do what you always do. And I think that's where these two images come together really helpfully, that the wedding image is one of alertness and expectancy. We need to think about, we need to be consciously ready for Jesus re to return. The thief picture is just one of faithful normality. We just keep serving because we never know when Jesus will return. So just like I hide my laptop every night because we might be broken into, all of us just live the Christian life faithfully every day because we never know when Jesus will return. But what, was it, what does it look like in practice to wait to serve? 
I think we're used to some of the extreme uh, wacky cults uh, who, you know, go and live in the woods while they wait for Jesus to return. But actually, the point of this passage, I think, is the opposite. Uh, waiting for Jesus to return is to, meant to look like the normal Christian life. Being a servant of Jesus is not being a super Christian or a special Christian. It's just basic, the basic Christian life. Loving one another, loving your enemy, being generous, meeting together, prayer, sharing the gospel, everyday discipleship, being a Christian. But the key thing is you've got to remember that you are a servant and to think of yourself as a servant so that these things will be at the forefront as you live for the Lord Jesus. We have to be conscious. It needs to be an aspect of our identity that shapes us. If I want to read more, I think of myself as a, as a reader. If I want to be more kind, I think of myself as a kind person. I'm a servant of Jesus. If I think of myself like that, it will help me to serve him more, to live my life directed to him and what he wants, not to me and what I want. So waiting for Jesus to return is meant to look like the normal Christian life. And that's uh, what Jesus goes on to develop in the next section. So the, the first uh, uh, section we've uh, looked at, thinking about Jesus uh, being a servant, is waiting for Jesus to return. The second section is to be faithful. It's to be faithful. Uh, Peter asks a fairly direct question, which is uh, what Peter likes to do. Uh, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everyone? And initially, uh, as we read on, we'll see that Jesus seems to avoid the question. Uh, he will come back to it, but rather than answer it directly, Jesus gives a parable about two choices a servant could make in their master's absence. Uh, the first choice is to be faithful. Uh, the Lord replied, who then is the faithful and prudent manager whom the master will appoint over his staff to give them a food allowance at the proper time? Being ready for Jesus' return, being a faithful servant, is being, uh, being wise and being faithful. It means being like a manager of uh, a large house. If you, uh, if you watched uh, Downton Abbey, like Carson or Elsie, uh, caring for those who are under them. Uh, faithfulness in that context, as Jesus says, means giving them food alliance at the proper time. And we can take this in, a, I think, in a, in a spiritual sense, uh, particularly for those of us who are in some kind of ministry leadership, pastors or youth group leaders, Bible study leaders, even parents. We're all charged to spiritually feed people uh, that we are responsible for. So being faithful means discharging the duties that the master has given you. And just as we saw in the, the wedding illustration, uh, blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing this task when he comes. Truly, I tell you, he will appoint him over many possessions. And, uh, you know, wonderful illustration of that in Genesis with uh, uh, Joseph uh, faithfully serving in Pharaoh's court and then being given control of the entire nation of Egypt. Well, the same promise is held out for believers. But again, there's also a warning. If the servant chooses to exploit the master's delay in returning, as Jesus continues, if that servant says in his heart, my master is delayed in coming, and so he begins to beat the other servants and maids and to eat and drink and get drunk, then the servant's master will arrive on a day he does not expect and an hour that he does not know. That master will cut him in pieces and allocate him a place with the unfaithful. Just as the reward seems so wonderfully lavish, a, a banquet, the master waiting on the servant, so here the punishment is strikingly harsh, being cut to pieces. But just like the banquet uh, was a picture of eternal life in God's new creation, being cut to pieces is a graphic image of judgment. The warning that Jesus gives is to abuse your position as a servant of Christ, particularly as a leader, is to be in the same position as those who don't believe. Those who abuse God's people, even if they claim to be Christians, will be punished with unbelievers. He will assign them a place with the unfaithful. 
It's a confronting picture, but it's a reminder that God's judgment is not a light thing. Uh, Hebrews reminds us that it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What Jesus is warning throughout this passage is against hypocrisy. Uh, Those uh, claiming to be a a servant of Christ, uh, positioning themselves perhaps as as a leader or someone with responsibility, and rather than using that to serve Christ and to love those they're responsible for, to abuse their position and to hurt those in their care. So Jesus turns to answer Peter's question. Remember Peter's question, is, that what, you're, uh, is what you're saying just for us or for everyone? Well, the last paragraph, as Jesus says there, that servant who knows his master's wishes and does not prepare for or perform his wish- wishes will receive a great beating. But the one who does not know his wishes and yet does what is worthy of punishment will receive a light beating. From everyone who has been given much, much will be expected. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, even more will be asked. So the answer to, to Peter's question is uh, what Jesus said applies to everyone. It just applies especially to uh, those who have been given much, much responsibility, much teaching. Uh, We've spoken about how the servants were to care for those under them. Well, you might not be a a parent, you might not lead a group, but here it's widened out. Can you see that Jesus is speaking about basic Christian discipleship? Uh, The wicked servant is is the servant who knows his master's wishes, but does not prepare for or perform his wishes. It's the Christian who knows what it means to live the Christian life, but doesn't do it, who ignores what Jesus says. Jesus is is teaching that with knowledge comes responsibility. Uh, Those of us who have received clear Bible teaching, uh, many of us have received clear Bible teaching for many, many years, well, we'll be held to greater account than those who have not. Both will still be punishment, punished, but the punishment will reflect the knowledge of the one being punished. Now, this is a, a kind of challenging aspect of Jesus' teaching. It's one we're maybe not uh, used to. He's already made a, a similar point in chapter 10 uh, when he said that those towns in which he performed miracles would be held more responsible than those in which he hadn't. But the point is that uh, if you have been given much, uh, particularly in terms of kind of the privilege of teaching and of hearing God's word, well, the responsibility is greater. So being a faithful servant means waiting for Jesus to return, but also being faithful with what you have heard. But finally, it also means uh, being wise, being wise and understanding why Jesus has come. If you look at the the top of uh, page uh, 45, uh, if I was to ask you how uh, uh, how you might expect Jesus to finish this sentence, Jesus says, I have come to, how would you expect Jesus to finish that sentence? I imagine you might think, I've come to bring salvation for the world, or I have come to bring peace on the earth. But it's actually quite surprising how Jesus finishes that sentence, isn't it, at the beginning of, uh, chap- of uh, page 45. I have come to cast fire on the earth, and how I wish it were burning already. Why did Jesus come into the world? He came into the world to cast fire on the earth. Is that uh, that something you use in your your gospel presentations? I think it's, it's, it's quite striking. What does Jesus mean? Well, fire in Scripture, particularly in Luke's gospel, stands for God's judgment. That Jesus has come to bring judgment, particularly here, judgment means division. Judgment means division. Look at how he uh, continues. Do you suppose I've come to establish peace in the world? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five people in one home will be divided. Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. Mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. 
Jesus has come to bring salvation wonderfully, but he's also come to bring judgment, which means division. Because following Jesus faithfully leads to division. It has to. Because if we follow Jesus, it divides us from the world. It divides us from the world. Decision and division are critical to following Jesus. To line up with Jesus is to line up against the world. It is to be divided from the world. Following him or serving him or following and serving those who are opposed to him. But Jesus doesn't just talk about this uh, division that he's going to bring. He continues, I have a baptism to experience and how distressed I am until it is achieved. Now, it's interesting, uh, we, uh, reading through Luke's gospel, you, you might remember back in uh, chapter 3, Jesus was already baptized by John the Baptist. So what's he talking about? He's already been baptized. In what sense does he have another baptism to be baptized with? Well, the baptism he's referring to is his death. Just like he was immersed in water in uh, the baptism by John, he will be immersed in death. Well, why is he so eager to go through this baptism? Why is he so eager, as he says, how distressed I am until it is achieved? He knows he has to go through death because death is the way that he brings salvation. And this is a reminder, as we said at the beginning, that it's not our faithful service uh, that puts us in a right relationship with God. No, it is his death. It is his death. And so the picture here is that those who trust in Jesus, who are in Christ, need not fear God's judgment because Jesus has gone through it for us. He has experienced the full force of God's wrath in his death, in his immersion uh, for us. And so our response to that death is to trust in it, to make us right with God. And once we're in that relationship with God, as we live our lives, we do so serving him faithfully and waiting for his return. So uh, if you're here uh, this evening, you're a, a Bible study leader, you're a mustard seeds teacher, you're a youth group leader, you're a parent, uh, the challenge, a uh, particular challenge for you uh, in faithful service of Jesus is, are you spiritually caring for those whom God has entrusted you? But the challenge for all of us is, are we, uh, as Jesus very simply says, doing what our master wants? Is that our life? Are we living consistent, faithful Christian lives? Do we consciously think of ourselves as servants of Jesus? Is that, that's, that is our identity as Christians. Are we thinking about that identity and allowing it to shape how we live our lives? Uh, sometimes you hear people say, uh, live every day as if it was your last. In other words, you, you've got to make the most, you've got to make the most of your life. But what we've seen in this passage is uh, live every day as if Jesus was coming back. And that doesn't mean uh, run into the woods uh, to, to hide and be ready. No, it means live a faithful Christian life as a servant of Jesus, because that's who you are. Let's pray. Be dressed, ready for action. Our Father, we pray that that might be our lives, dressed, ready for action, ready for the return of the Lord Jesus as we uh, live as his servants, uh, faithful, wise lives as we wait for him to return. And we ask it in his name. Amen.